In the December of 1913, we pitched our tents in beech bush above a mountain stream called the Glen Tui. The whole district was called the Glen Tui, and it was well named, for in those days the foothills were alive with native birds. Tuis, mockymarks, pigeons, riflemen, wakers, and that loneliest sounding of all night birds, the moorpork. To this day, I've only to hear a moorpork and... I smell hot canvas, moss, wood smoke and fern, and I hear the endless colloquy of a mountain river in consultation with wet stones. Christmas Eve came in very hot that year. We dragged our straw-stuffed mattresses out of our tents and slept under the trees and under the stars. Starlight glanced and winked beyond the beech branches, and when the moon rose, it looked as if it had been crackle-glazed with twigs. The campfire pulsed and faded and settled into a glow. More porks called to each other across the valley, and wakers, who stole our spoons when they could, once or twice shrieked vaingloriously in the bush. But we listened before we slept to a silence that was made up of countless infinitesimal sounds, small rustling movements, and always the undertone of cold, hurrying water. In the bush, everything stirs at first light, and on Christmas morning we woke to the dawn chorus of bellbirds, pigeons fat and clumsy, whirred and flopped over the ridgepoles of our tents. How very extraordinary that bell-chiming bird chorus is. The dusk was uh, alive with it, remote, unearthly, all-pervading, a swarm of little feathery bells. Christmas was beginning in the bush, and it was going to be a very hot day. We washed in the river, sustaining the tug of icy water, and when we were dressed, we heard another bell, only just distinguishable from the birds, and we walked through the still dark bush to an open glade on a terrace above the river, and there, against the eastern sky, an altar of green beech poles had been raised, furnished with a white and gold cloth and lit with candles. There wasn't a breath of wind, the candle flames stood like spearheads, and the celebrant's vestments glinted in the half-light. How very strange now, almost sixty years later, is the recollection of that altar, set so arbitrarily, so unexpectedly, so sur surrealistically in a bush clearing against wan stars in a paling sky. Twigs snapped under our knees, the primordial smell of the bush, wet earth, dry earth, green life and honeydew, mingled with the sweetish smell of the wine. And throughout the celebration the bellbirds kept it up as if all through the foothills they observed some ancient business of their own. Our service came to its end. Morning was established, the trees assumed their familiar shapes, the birdsong stopped, and presently the smell of frying bacon and the clunk of a kerosene tin bucket announced breakfast. And later, when one returned to the glade, the altar had gone, almost as if it had been part of a dream.